reading from Isaiah 64, verses 1 through 9, using my NRSV study Bible. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence. It's important to know that this is the time after the captivity in Babylon of the Jewish people. And the remnant that stayed behind, was not captive, was left behind, has been working on rebuilding the city and the temple. And now uh, folks will be coming back to be involved in that project. And during this time, um, people became separated from the scripture tells us. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence, Isaiah speaks to the Lord. As when fires, as when fire kindle, kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When, when you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you and your ways, but you were angry and we sinned. As you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like the one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf. All our and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yes, yet, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord. And do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The word of God. For the people of God. Amen. So, let us pray. Gracious God, may the Holy Spirit be with us today as we hear your word. Lead us to receive, interpret, and apply your holy scriptures to our lives. We are humble before you, and may our only desires be for your eternal presence and love. Amen. So, yikes! <laughs> That's how I felt a couple of days ago. As of today, we are officially in the season of Advent. Yikes! It's hard to believe. It just seems too early. It has snuck up on me, and perhaps it has on you too. The sun is shining beautifully outside, uh, kind of messing up the computer screen. And it doesn't seem Christmassy, right? But that isn't stopping us from trying to usher it in ahead of time. I've talked to a lot of folks. I've seen stuff where folks are just trying to bring Christmas in right now. We want to get happy. We want to feel good. We're tired of all this junk that's going on. We want Christmas. From what I hear and see, some of you are ushering in Christmas early. Decorations were going up weeks ago, including giant Santa Clauses and snowmen. A family not far from us in Liberty was lamenting the loss of their yard decorations. Yes, someone had made off with their inflatable Christmas arch, and they're 10 foot tall, frosting the snowman. And it wasn't even Thanksgiving yet. And already they had their lawn decorations stolen. I suspect that some uh, elementary detective work might lead us to a neighbor's garage for the purloined icon of Advent. I can see one of their neighbors, maybe, Having, that has to look at that giant snowman across the street for a week or two around Christmas, which doesn't seem unreasonable, but when he's, it's looming over the hedges for a month and a half, it gets a little old for anyone. 
Besides, at night, when they all deflate, you have these mushy piles of red and white and green fluttering in the neighborhood. Of course, the worst perpetrators in early decorating are the ones that have music playing through loudspeakers all the time. Frosty the Snowman, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and Grandma got run over by a reindeer ad benitum forever, it seems like. You know, there are some people who actually play Christmas music all the time. Who heard of this? I realize that we are all anxious for good times. And Christmas is always the best times. Parties, gift buying and giving, decorating. It's okay to, be, to smile and to be jolly. It's okay to get a little crazy with the decorating and the music. All of it. Good times have been rare for most of us, I think, lately. Christmas is a wonderful time that has generated warm memories for many folks. Unfortunately, the original reason for the celebrating sometimes gets lost in the fluff of our modern Christmas. Tiny Babe, who in reality is the God of the universe, is born to a poor couple who are soon to be refugees, fleeing their home to keep their baby from danger. Our attention this Christmas season is best kept on this baby who is ultimately our Savior. This is the first time he comes to save us. The Advent season is the beginning of Jesus' arrival in our lives. The ordinary time season of the church, which ends today, ordinary time ends today, it's that time between Easter and Advent. That's over today. But it led us into the second time that Jesus comes into our lives. What we know for sure is that we will be surprised when he shows up again. See, the first time, on his first arrival, we celebrate joyously. The second has not occurred yet, as of right now, this minute. But we will be surprised when he shows up again, especially if we've not been paying attention. Just as surely as Jesus came among us 2,000 years ago, the kingdom of God will arrive in fullness here. For many of us, that will be another yikes moment. Our scripture today, at first look, doesn't seem to relate to Advent. It is about the prophet Isaiah voicing the lament of the Jewish people. Their city and, and their beautiful temple, built by Solomon, have been destroyed. The Babylonian Empire had come to town in a big way, and the Israelites suffered captivity and exile in Babylon. The remnant was left to survive the best they could and to begin the work of rebuilding. And they felt deserted by their God. He has, in fact, turned his back on them. They've broken their covenant with God, despite the warnings of the prophets to turn back to God. God said he would love and save them. They would be his people if they would but love and worship him. God has had enough of their disobedience and he separated himself from them as they have with him. Now, bearing the brunt of loss and destruction of their land, the prophet begs God to tear the curtain of what seems like a physical barrier. A physical barrier between God and his people. I think that's something that some folks 
struggle with today. I think they feel there is a physical barrier between them and God. Of course, there isn't. It's up to folks like us to help them with that. So Isaiah asked God to tear this curtain. And the high and lofty God is petitioned to tear open the heavens and descend in an awesome display of power and might. Why, after having suffered the hardships of the Babylonian destruction and captivity and having been promised redemption, why are the Israelites still denied God's salvation? Throughout Israel's history, there's a trail of broken covenants as the people go to and, and then turn their backs on them. And now, God is quiet. And Isaiah cries out. But were they ready? Throughout Israel's history, people look for a savior, a leader to save them and establish a strong and vibrant kingdom. Come, Emmanuel, come. And finally, God does come. God in Jesus, God in the flesh, to take his word personally to his people. A word of hope, joy, Peace, love, all of our candles appear by the altar. A promise. All they had to do was believe the good news. Believe the good news. My favorite sermon. Repent and believe the good news. Your favorite too is the shortest one. That is the true promise of Christmas. The reason we should celebrate is because God did come to us the only way he could in human form, as one of us. He had to become human to be able to walk among us and speak to us. He seeks us. And this time it was him doing the talking and not a prophet. He has come along he has come along beside us as Jesus, the Son, and through that has changed the world. He said he would be with us to the end of the age, and he continues to create, love, heal, comfort, and save us. Isaiah refers to God as a potter, turning the clay, shaping, forming, firing, firing meaning, Eating, cooking the clay, constantly creating and recreating us, his people, to suit his purposes. Look how the whole world has been changed and shaped by his teachings. Did you ever go through a change? Some question, right? We can't help it. We can't help but go through changes. Emotional, biological, physical, spiritual. I sure have. We can't deny that we change. And it's not always an easy process because we often fight it. But there is a good chance God is in it. God is in change. God is a potter. And he gets his hands dirty. He gets involved with us. Gets in the trenches. As his pupils, his people, we must do the same to accomplish what he needs us to do, being disciples. Being disciples sometimes means getting dirty. Get the work done. It's digging in doing God's work as he leads us to do it. I'll say it one more time. Yikes! <laughs> it's Advent. No matter how much we follow the development of the Christian year, we are still surprised when Advent comes. It seems too early, doesn't it? The beautiful sunshine out there today. 
No snow. Snow grayness. It's too early, we tell people. It can't be time for this. We're just not ready. We have much to do. Our lists grow longer. We get less done. For everything we check off, six more slip onto the list. How's that happen? I found out I could download an app for my cell phone that is like post-it notes. I mean, I'm the guy that would put a post-it note in his phone to remember something. But now they got this app that is in your phone and it'll show up on your screen. You just tap an icon and this note, this post-it note appears on your screen with the list that you typed of everything your wife, I mean, everything you need <laughs> to remind yourself to do, but you still have to keep it up. Add things that need done and take them off when you do them. They don't disappear from your phone by themselves, I found out. <laughs> I thought there were elves to do that. You know, mysterious things in the phone. You know, the whole legend uh, thing about elves came into being because of the mysterious changing of to-do lists. People found their Christmas to-do lists growing almost before their eyes. Who's doing this? Must be elves. Anyhow, it contributes to our not being ready. You no doubt remember being sent to clean your room. I mean, we were all teenagers at one time, kids. And you also remember your first thought as you stumbled through the door and flopped onto the bed. <laughs> Looks clean to me, right? Never mind the pile of dirty clothes on the floor or the stack of papers teetering on the edge of the desk you can barely see the top of. Yeah, maybe that's a banana peel on the floor or an apple core or a bag of chips that you finished a few days ago. But it looks clean to me. Or maybe clean enough. Isaiah comes along to ask us to take another look at our living space. Like our mom, Isaiah stands at the door and tells us that company's coming. And would you just take a look at the kind of squalor that you're living in? <laughs> what would happen, the old prophet shouts, if the one you claim to be waiting for were to show up today? What if the one you want to come home for opened this door right here and came charging into this room? What then, smart guy? What if the God you call for answers shows up? Are you sure you're ready for that? Are we sure we are ready for the reality of Christmas? Well, see, that's that's our task in Advent. I've got a lot of tasks in Advent. Most of them involve pressures and wiring. <laughs> Our task and our real task in Advent is to pay attention to what is, what might be. Not simply to look back at what was. We keep looking back at what was. We're not really ready for Him. We need to prepare for God coming into our lives. We need to prepare for God being in your life. The people of God were in exile. The foundations of their nation had been shaken. The comforts that they had begun to take for granted were taken from them. The human institutions that they had constructed no longer held the security that they had begun to take for granted. Does that sound familiar? So they began to look for help. They realized that their faith was shaking. They had become complacent in their relationship with God. Advent is a reminder 
to get out of our sense of complacency. So it's hard to be complacent when things are difficult, when all is going well. Then we need Advent to wake us up. But when things are difficult, Advent is a reminder of hope. And to become aware again of all that God is. Advent is a time to get ready. We all need a little 